Now, you're very welcome back. So, delighted to welcome to the show, eight-time All-Ireland winner, amongst many other things, Philly McMahon is with us. Hey, Philly, great to have you on. Good to talk to you. Thanks for having me on. Cheers. No, lovely to have you on. So, we're talking to you today. I know you've been doing the rounds. You're launching the Darkness into Light Walk 2022. So, this is all about raising funds, right. organised by Pieta House, supported by Electric Ireland. The date this year is May the 7th. I know a lot of people... Well, this has grown over the years massively and a lot of people get a lot of solace from it and really enjoy it in its own way, even though there is a degree of sadness at times associated with it. But it's a powerful uh, experience by all accounts. I've never done it. Have you done it before, the walk? Yeah, yeah, I have. Uh, I actually done it in my own community in Ballymun. So uh, they've done a kind of mini version of it in, um, in in the local park. So uh, a, lot, a lot of the Dublin lads do it. Um, it's just a, it's just a nice thing to do with family members, friends, and get up at a certain time that you don't really get up at. Unless you're like me at the minute, who was a new new father, who was up all hours of the night. So um, I'd be used to it come the seventh. But um, yeah, it's a special. You have to you have to do it to kind of experience. Like it's you know when you see it happening, you kind of go, "Isn't that great?" But when you do it, it's just it's that energy is amazing. You know. Mm. What first attracted you to doing it? Um, first of all my education around the whole topic of mental health and then kind of seeing the effects and the noise it makes when it's um when it's happening how positive it is uh seeing family members getting together to celebrate loved ones who unfortunately have passed from suicide um there's something special about that connection piece for me and um just the noise and the electric, how electric it is around the country when it's on is just does it for me in terms of one of be being one of the most positive events in, in the in the country that we have, you know. Yes, must be uh, very charged emotionally, full spectrum of emotions. I would think. Yeah, like it, it, it comes from it. Like the, the the whole title of it is is um is really important because it comes from a dark place, really, doesn't it? And then. It shines, a, it shines a light on at the end of it. So you really do go through that process when you're doing it. Um, so whether it's, you know, you're walking, running, hiking, wherever it may be, sharing a coffee while dealing with family and friends, it's just, it's something we don't do enough of, I suppose. And to highlight the, you know, the reason why we do it, like raising over what, 8 million euro um, across five continents is, is incredible, like 17 countries. Yeah. Well, people would have heard you talking brilliantly about the experience of your late brother John down the years. And then even I always vividly remember and we even have it in a bit of a montage here, actually. I don't know if you've ever heard it on the show, but it's a montage about Dublin winning one of the All-Irelands and Maura Trasny Callag is talking to you and she was asking, what were you thinking about the final whistle? And I think you ambushed her and the rest of us by just saying, my dad, you know, he passed, I think, that year. So you've experienced a lot of grief. I mean, that's a lot for a family to to bear. Do you... um? Do you think about them often or is it more at those profound moments or maybe a mixture of the two? Yeah, like um, when you lose somebody, you, you, they're always, like even if you go through the grieving process, it's, it doesn't mean that everything is done and it's gone and it's forgotten and you don't have the human emotions anymore connected to it. It's, it's always there. You're always reminded. And when I went and got support after my dad, so when my brother John passed, I thought working hard was a way of, grieving and uh, getting through the grievance and then actually when I wrote my book The Choice that was really the reason I understood grieving because I was chatting around John's friends and family members and we were crying laughing all of those emotions brings out the grieving process and they say when suddenly you lose somebody from a suicide or a drug or alcohol related death that it takes it in around roughly four years to understand grievance and it's called a special death which is they say, unfortunately, it's the equivalent of losing two people right. in terms of pain and suffering. So when my dad passed, I thought I was in a space to kind of say, do you know what? I've dealt with this. I've got good learnings from my brother John's passing, but I didn't. But the great thing that came out of that was I went and asked for help. I went and got help. And the key thing that came from that help was every time I'm reminded of my dad or my brother, even in a conversation we're having right now, that's because of memories of love. 
and it could be it could it can come across cliche and fluffy but it really is like when you think about it those memories when you when you're reminded of a person that you lose that's love that's that's what you're here to do that's what you're here to to give in the, in the world um is that is creating memories and love mm. It's, uh, I, I, I thankfully look touch wood and nobody can avoid it forever. I've never lost anyone that immediately close to me. It must be another aspect of the experience where John was always your older brother and now you're getting older than John when he passed. You must look at photos of him now and he's starting to look quite young. That's another aspect of that relationship, I'd say, which is quite strange. Yeah, it's good. It's a good, it's, I mean, like it's, it's something that you feel like you've lost a younger brother now. You know, because you're a little bit older than when, to, to to when he passed. Um, but it's it's also the other things like having a, a a new child and not having his uncle around or having his grandfather around, and they're the things that I I kind of miss most. You know, not having my dad around because my dad was brilliant. I've always said uh, my dad was brilliant with kids, with the grandkids, with me and my siblings. Mm. And I would have loved Lennon, my son, my newborn son, to experience that. And also I would have loved that to ha- to ha- like to basically him having an uncle. Um, from my side of the family, he doesn't have an uncle. Mm. As I was now that John is gone, I'm in a house of women. <laughs> I've got three sisters, so he's got three brilliant aunties. But yeah, look, he doesn't have uh, an uncle or granddad. But that's something that you just have to get on with. You can't just that's just life. That's the way it happens. Yeah. Did your father go suddenly, Philly, or was there an illness? He had cancer. He had uh, stomach cancer. And um, the the difficulty with my dad and the brilliant story about my dad was he was born in West Belfast. And just as he was in his teenage years, the trouble started. And at the age of 16, he was at a dance hall and he was walking home with his friends. And he walked around the corner and the British Army shot they shot up up the road basically and shot him in the stomach. They thought it was a rubber bullet. It was actually a, a, a bullet. And um, he struggled for years. So he got shot in the stomach, struggled for years with pain through his stomach, joined the trouble, got involved in the troubles based off that, which which you could imagine would generally happen. You're being shot by this country that's trying to oppress you. And, you know, when you when you look at the, the equality, religious, religious problems that happened in the North, mm. He joined the trouble. He joined the, the Republican movement, and um, then he came down, and he, he actually he was interned. He escaped from from Newry Jailhouse, and he came down south, and uh, and basically later on, just to shorten the story, years got, went by, and he could never the last couple of years he could never differentiate the pain. He wouldn't have been able to differentiate the pain between cancer and, and the the the. the supposed to pain from the gunshot wound and he got stomach cancer and eventually um he he fought for a year uh bravely and uh gave me loads of lessons along that journey mm. and uh, unfortunately passed a lot of his you call them comrades or people that he went to interned with a lot of them have died from cancer and um lung issues and stuff like that because they dropped cs gas into into um Long cash when there was a riot. You're joking. Yeah, yeah. He was a list of a hundred odd men who have died from um cancers and, and um yeah, respiratory a, a, a cluster of sorts. Got that shocking. I hadn't realised that. Yeah, well see C C R gas is what they got, sorry, got dropped in and C R gas was never used ever again. Mm. And so when you say the stomach pain he may then have ignored the early signs of cancer and thought, oh, it's just a legacy of the bullet to the stomach as opposed to something more serious. Yeah, exactly. He would have felt the same pains for a long period of time. And, and um, when he went then and got diagnosed, it was it was too late. So he went, I won't, I won't say which hospital, he went to a hospital and felt really bad. And they said to him, um, we'll do your bloods, done, the, done his blood, sent him home. And then a couple of months later, he went to a different hospital and, and one of the, the doctors there said, no, this man's very ill. We need to get it, get him checked, get him morphine, settle the pain. Gave him the news. Unfortunately, he was terminally ill with cancer at that stage. And then about three or four months later after that, we got a letter from the, the first hospital he went to saying he had 
you know, it's stage four cancer in the stomach. So it was too late. The results came back too late, mm. uh, which is, that's that that was hurtful for the family, like, you know. Yeah, well, May, there's, there's a bit of anger there, I suspect, you know, it'd be only human. Yeah, look, who knows what would have happened. Sure. That's the thing, sure. you know. But again, going back to the point, look, at this is, this is life, you know, yeah. and you, if you hold on to those regrets or if you try hold on to that anger, you'll live a really unhappy life. Mm. I mean, not to uh, get into it too much, I'd say, but uh, in so much as you're comfortable, he must have had a story or two to tell about getting involved in the troubles and fighting for a cause he believed in and being interned. I mean, that's not a usual experience. Yeah, look, I mean, I wouldn't have been able to speak too much about me dad. <laughs> um, a lot of people would have known, a lot of friends and family would have known of his involvement but I wouldn't if he was here on this planet today I probably wouldn't be saying these things you know okay. he, can't, he can't be harmed you know so that's probably the way I would uh, in relation to stories he was um, he was a type of man that he was he was kind of strong willed in that he believed in his his, his you know uh, su- I suppose supporting his community in, in the cause that he had to you know take up in and, and, and for me that probably is why I'm probably very passionate about my community also, probably passed on to me, you know. Mm. Um, but in relation to stories, uh, so yeah, he would have told me some stories, but then a lot of the stories he wouldn't have been, like he wouldn't have felt, I think he wouldn't have felt that it would have been okay to tell me to hold on to those stories. It wouldn't have been fair, like, you know. Yeah. But the ones that he would have told me were, you know, they're hero- heroic in, in many ways. And there was a lot of stories that he would have, had lessons from also that maybe, you know, caused pain on both sides of, of the atrocity of the troubles. Yes, I've no doubt. Fatherhood, what has surprised you about it? Sleep. <laughs> <laughs> how 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 uh, excited I am to hear a burp. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, it's a, yeah, it's an incredible feeling. It's just it's. The, the time when we were in when Sarah went into uh, labour to to hear the baby cry it's just wow it's 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 powerful it's nothing I've ever experienced in my life and as much as I'm sleep deprived right now it it's well worth it you know and it's it's something that I'd I'd never take back obviously I can't but <laughs> uh, it's yeah it's a magic moment for me and it's um, yeah it's good it's, it's just I, it's hard to put into words, isn't it? Really, like it's just, it's really, it's a, it's a brilliant phase in, in life that you just, you've got this little small person that is it. Just, do you know what, lads? It's like getting a, a brand new car, and you just want to try it all the time. You, you know, you're sitting outside, it's brand new, and you just want to get back in and drive it. And that's the way I am with it at, at the minute. We, you know, I'm at, at work here, but I just want to get home to see him. You know. Yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine. And were you able to attend the birth, or was it COVID, or was it messy, or how did it go for you? Um, at this at the beginning, it was quite messy. Like you know, I couldn't go into some of the the, um, the scans. But as it went on, we were very lucky that I was I was allowed to go in. Um, and the story I'm going to tell Lennon when he's older is the week you came was the week that ended the uh, pandemic, <laughs> COVID <laughs> pandemic, because the week after everything was kind of all the restrictions were gone. Um, so that we were very, very lucky. I know there's a lot of parents out there now that had a difficult time around the whole process. But again, we were very lucky. So like a lot of change in your life at the moment, you know, uh, fatherhood, retiring from the dubs. Uh, I think, I'm not sure how long you've been in with Bohemians. Are you still in as a performance coach with Bose? And if so, yeah. h- how's that going? What's that experience like? <laughs> Well, first thing is like it's it, this is the this is the second season with Bose, and um, I suppose the Bose thing helped me massively because I was going through a period um, with Dublin where I was on the way out my last season, and the stuff I was doing with Bose, if I didn't act upon that in my own uh, environment with Dublin, then I would have been hip- hypocritical. So. It, it helped me massively. Um, Is it not not throwing the toys out of the pram kind of a thing? Yeah, like, I mean, it, like, you know, there's a couple of things, there's a couple of variables there that you would have liked to go your way in terms of game time. And, like, I, I didn't play a minute yeah. in the championship apart from an all or in semi-final 
which I played 40 minutes, which is a, it's, it's, it's strange to think, you know, you don't play one minute and then you play 45 minutes in a semi-final and possibly because of the injuries in that semi-final, you're looking at it definitely impacting the final, if not starting, if not coming on, you know, so, um, so yeah, and, and every player goes through that, you know, every player will go through that in the last season, but the balls thing with the people that are there from the players to the management, to the club itself, it's a special place, it's a special club, and um, it's been brilliant for me, in fairness, not just from that point of view, but also outside of other things outside of, and outside of the sport, you know? Yeah. And is your role there to have one-on-one sessions with players? Is it to watch training and give broader feedback? Is it, is it full-time or, or how does it work for you? Yeah, it's, it's full-time. Mm-hmm. Um, so, it, it look at, in, a, in a nutshell, it's basically looking at trying to get the boys to go from A to B um, and trying to give them um, whatever tools I can to help that happen. So that's that's a, that's in a nutshell, yeah. Trying to get them from A to B. Because you, and correct me if I'm wrong here, you seem to always have had loads on the go. I mean, even as a player, you were juggling while well, making the documentary and you were doing the book and working in your community and, and various um, ventures, be they like food, fitness, gym. I was never quite sure, but it always seemed to me like you were very ambitious from a professional point of view. Is, are a lot of those plates still spinning as well? Yeah, yeah. Look, I, I love I love uh, what I do. Um, most of it, if you think about it, is around coaching. Mm. Um, so the stuff I do in prisons, coaching people in prisons, it, the gym is a coaching environment, um, Bohemians coaching. And uh, yeah, so so it's about people, I suppose. That's the one thing I'm, I'm really passionate about trying to get people, um, get the, getting the best out of people through the knowledge that I have and through the experiences I have. So I'm very, yeah, again, look, it's it's one of those things. Everything happens for a reason. You work hard, you do well in your sporting career and, and doors open. And that's what I'm constantly looking at is what opportunities are out there now that I have 40 plus hours because <laughs> I'm not playing the dubs, you know? So, um so yeah, look, the, the the balls thing is is really is really good because it challenges you every time. The gym had its challenges through COVID and it's grown and it's getting better. Um, the NutriQuick is doing really well, you know, um, in terms of the food company, and uh, you know the social work with the with the stuff around. I'm doing around Ballymun and prisons is, is is really cool. But again, I can't forget the family stuff because that's going to be important for me. Um, uh, now that I'm not, I don't have the excuse of playing for the Dublin team. <laughs> yeah. uh, fair play, yeah. I don't, know, I don't know how you're juggling it all, and not to mention you've jumped over to the dark side and started writing columns in the Irish Independent as well. So, <laughs> you know, uh, I'm sure you're, you're getting uh, the the silent treatment from a few uh, former teammates. Um, what are you <laughs> making of what's going on with Dublin? I saw an interesting line from you speaking earlier on today because you were, you know, again, Philly McMahon's talking to us to launch the Darkness into Light walk this year which is on May 7th and darknessintolight.ie is where you can sign up and we would encourage you to do so so May the 7th this year and it's supported yeah. by Electric Ireland as well I saw an interesting line when you were speaking to the media earlier where of the I guess we can call it a decline of sorts in Dublin you said I suppose I did see it coming but I didn't see it happening this soon yeah yeah like uh, what, what, well in sporting terms who have you seen that has stayed successful for the for the whole career, like in a sport and in a team environment, like you know, obviously boxers can do it and MMA fighters and all that sort of stuff because they're individuals and they have more control. But when you're in a team environment, there's, there's so many moving pieces. Mm. You know, even the All Blacks had had their dip. The you know South Africa, all these teams, they they've had their dips. But ultimately, um, when there's a transition, there the challenge is. Uh, who who do you have? What personnel do you have to get over that challenge? And I suppose Jim Gavin was the person to do it the last time around, where he won in All Ireland in twenty eleven, sorry twenty thirteen, lost in fourteen, and then went on that run in two thousand fifteen on. So the challenge to Desi and this group is: can they replicate that in a much tougher environment? Because you're now going off the back of a team that a management team had won six in a row, five in a row, sorry, Desi's won in his first year. Um, and you're also four, four and zero in terms of losses in the league. So it's a massive challenge, but an opportunity comes from that, which is like, lads, wouldn't it be amazing 
to win the All Ireland in 2022 after everybody doubting us and after losing the first four games. Mm. And it starts with Tyrone this week, the All Ireland champions of last year. If we can beat them through a battle, which it's going to be, well, that will move us nicely onto the last two games, which will move us nicely into the championship. Mm. And we're still under the radar a little bit. And there's still teams that will think they're, that they might have us in terms of the Mayos and the Currys. But that's where we're going in at a different angle this year. Yeah, see, I think we're getting a glimpse there at the the brilliant mentality which lets you win eight All-Irelands. If I get you to put on your analyst hat for a second, what would you say are the biggest issues they need to try and fix short term? Um, so, so, so let me let me give you a quick overview of where what where I think they could get after first of all. They they need to get after the mindset first of all. Okay, the noise is impacting their performances. I would imagine, right? So, so what I'm saying is the the information, social media, friends, family, clubmates, all of this stuff. It's all around relegation. Right. Yeah. Now, it needs to be all about the challenge and the vision, right? Which is essentially let's get a good performance against the All Ireland champions. So going in as an underdog is a little bit different, but it's also there's a little bit more energy than ah it's another game. You wear the favourites. We have to keep up our own standards. That kind of mentality, right? So there's a there's a bit of a spin of a narrative there that I think I'd be excited for, right? Mm. That's the start point. Tactically, then. Uh, you're going to come up against a Tyrone that I don't think they have the energy like they did last year. Um, in, in in respect to, they were very calm, they were very selective last year, especially they, they would have got massive learning from the COVID situation between uh, the Kerry, the, you know, whether they were going to play Kerry or not. When they played Kerry, they controlled the momentum of the game. Dublin need to get, get ahead of the game early. If they can get ahead early, well, then they can control the momentum and draw Tyrone out, which will then hopefully give them the chance to, to to put a few goals away, which they haven't had in any of the games so far. They, they're limited in terms of goal chances. So most teams are saying, let's go after Dublin's kickouts. Let's get after the space they have in front of the full back line. And let's also slow them down and not concede any goals against them. And when we get ahead, they'll come out and then we'll transition and counter fast. So they're the things that I'm sure what's happening in the Tyrone change room, they're the things they're looking at. Mm, mm. Um, so it's evenly matched for me, in fairness, in terms of the, the like, Tyrone are, are, are not are not where they, I'm sure, want to be, and, and neither are Dublin. So mm. there's a real dangling carrot after this one for me. Well, listen, it's going to be interesting in a few weeks. Uh, thank you so much for the time and for... I mean, I didn't know what I was going to talk to you about, really, but it was a really uh, great conversation. So thank you for doing that. And again, you were speaking to us to launch Darkness into Light. So the date this year is May 7th, Saturday, as the sun rises, and you can sign up at darknessintolight.ie. Uh, Philly McMahon, you have a young child you want to get home to, so we'll let you go. Thanks a million. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you.